All right, let's uh, open up with prayer and we'll get into our teaching for tonight. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this second letter that Peter has written to persecuted Christians. And Lord, there's so much uh, wealth of information in there that uh, is so applicable to our lives today. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you empower me now to speak the words that you would have uh, this group here. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, consider a letter that was written to a pastor. It's been written, it says, I've been attending your church for several years, and as a result of a growing conviction in my heart, the result of your diligent preaching, and seeming to be powerless against the temptations which arise in my heart, and constantly succumbing to them, and talks with pastors and godly men about my growing doubts, I have been led to believe I am not saved. How sad it is for me not to be able to enter into heaven because of the sin which clings to me and from which I long to be free. How bizarre for me who teaches Sunday school, a trainer in evangel evangelical training and a disciple. So many times I have determined in my heart to repent, to shake loose my want to sin, to forsake all for Jesus, only to find myself doing the very sin I do not want to do and not doing the things that I should do. After my fiance and I broke up, I memorized Ephesians as part of an all out effort against sin, only to find myself weaker and more painfully aware of my sinfulness, more prone to sin than ever before, grabbing cheap thrills to push back the pain of lost love, mostly in the heart, but it's where it counts and that's where you live. I sin because I'm a sinner. I'm like a soldier without my armor, running across a battlefield, getting shot up by fiery darts of sin. I couldn't leave the church if I wanted to. I love the people. I'm enthralled by the gospel of the beautiful Messiah. I'm a pile of manure on the white marble floor of Christ, a mongrel dog that snuck in the back door of the king's banquet to lick the crumbs off the floor. And by being close to Christians who are rich in the blessings of Christ, I get some of the overflow. I ask that you pray for me, and then he signed his name. Well, that's a heartbreaking letter, no doubt. But interestingly, when the pastor followed up with this individual, and when he talked with people who knew the author, there was a universal confidence that this person was a Christian. The only problem, the individual who wrote the letter wasn't convinced. Why? Well, tonight Peter is going to speak to us about the certainty of our salvation. Our scripture passage is 2 Peter chapter 1, and I've entitled our lesson, Our Glorious Salvation, and it's broken into the sections. First, 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2, the introduction. I worked all week on that title, the introduction. Mm -hmm. Secondly, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 12, the reality of our salvation. And then thirdly, 2 Peter 1, 13 to 21, the rewards of our salvation. So in the introduction, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, when you look at that, you kind of glance through it and you want to just kind of get on to what's the real meat of what Peter has to say. But then you kind of break down each of those sentences. You take each of the words and kind of say, what is the meaning? Why did he put this here? And you come up with a tremendous interpretation. Think about it. He uses the words faith. He uses the word righteousness. He uses the word savior. He uses the word grace. He uses the word peace, the phrase knowledge of God. He uses salvation terms in his opening greetings to these people. And these are people that are believers. This is the same group that he addressed in 1 Peter. But he's immediately calling on his readers to remember the reality of their salvation. They've been saved, and he wants them to look back. He's reminding his readers that, that all their salvation should mean to them. Don't forget about the magnitude of their redemption. And again, if you look at verses 12 through 15 in 2 Peter 1, you see that he says, I am going to keep reminding you of these things. I'm going to keep insisting that you remember. 
This letter was written about 30 years after the death of Christ. And what he's telling them is, I don't want you to forget the magnitude of your salvation. I don't want you to forget how much that meant and what that sacrifice was, and that you've been selected out of eternity before the, the foundations of the world were put together to be a believer. And that's what that salvation means. And that means you can't stand pat. You can't just sit there and say, I'll accept that gift, and I won't do anything with it. Peter is saying that's not acceptable, and I'm here to remind you, maybe even nag you, that you need to take that salvation as a platform or a foundation and then grow from there. And that's what those opening verses are saying. He's reminding them. Think of what he said. He said, you've obtained a salvation, a saving faith. That was given to them, right? One that saves, and it's a gift that was given to them by God. What they should be saying is, God, how can I ever find the words to say, I thank you for saving me from, from death and eternity and hell? He said, you've been given a faith to believe in Jesus and to be redeemed, right? And with that comes something that you need to do. But then he also says, you have an equal standing. Think about the readers of this letter, right? These are new Christians. And here you have somebody who actually walked with Jesus writing to them. And he says, you know what? Your salvation is the same as mine. We're equal in the eyes of Christ, right? There's nothing that says that we have anything more than you do. We obtained a saving faith the same as that you have. There's no inequality in the body of Christ. We all have an equal standing before God. It's equal to the apostles. That must have been encouraging for these folks to hear. He uses the word righteousness. He said the reason we've all received an equal share or equal value is because we have a God who is fair and doesn't make distinctions. He gives us equally his mercy and his grace. He uses the word multiplied. He said we've received from God because of his mercy to us of faith or our salvation, which is equal to all other faiths. There, there's no distinction, right? That gives us a perfect standing in Christ. And the reason for that is to multiply grace upon grace and peace upon peace on us, right? So there's a purpose of that salvation. It isn't just to save you and bring you into heaven with him. That's going to happen. But there's also an expectation of you have a responsibility because of that greatness that has taken place in your salvation, and you need to act on that. In essence, Verse one in this, this epistle is God's verse. He does his part, right? He gave us our salvation. But verse two is our part. We respond with knowledge. It's our responsibility to really know Christ. And when, when he says to know Christ, to grow in knowledge, he's talking about a deep, a full, a rich, a genuine type of knowledge about who this Jesus is that has given you this gift of salvation. And he wants it to multiply within you. Well, how does that happen? Peter's point here is when the deep knowledge is there, then the real faith is there. What that deep knowledge is, is knowing Christ. Look at how many terms he uses to describe him. It's a knowledge of Christ that recognizes him as God, as Savior, as Jesus, as Christ, as Messiah, as Lord, in the fullness of all that those words embody. In other words, Peter's saying, you have a responsibility to have a better knowledge of Christ, right? I've given you the basics, which means that your salvation, you're saved, and that you know what Christ did for you on the cross, and you know that his blood has, has washed the sins away to make you equal with other believers in the eyes of, 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 of God, right? But that's not the depth of Christ. That's not going to change the way you live here on earth. And I'm going to give you some things that I want you to really think about and apply to your life so that you can take that salvation that was given to you as a gift and then mature and grow in that. So his point is, don't take your salvation for granted. Remember what it felt like to be redeemed. You're going to see Peter here talk a lot about remembering. He's going to talk about, think back to what it was like when you first became saved. I want you to keep that kind of peace and joy and the excitement you had when you first became a believer, and now I want you to grow from there. And that's what he's going to talk about as he gets into the riches of the salvation, right? When he gets into verses 3 through, two, through 11, he starts talking about all of those things that are riches that are a byproduct of the salvation that they've received. So he wants his readers to understand, to remember who they were in Christ 
and what they possess in Christ. Now, remember who he's writing to. He's writing to a persecuted group of believers that are sitting there hanging on by, by their, their, you know, the thread because of the persecution they're receiving from their environment, right? These are the same people that we read about in, in uh, 1 Peter, right? But what Peter is saying is you're not going to dodge the persecution or the trials. In fact, you're going to use that to perfect your faith. And as you're perfecting your faith, I want you to do certain things. Because when you come out of it on the other side, you're going to be a real witness for Jesus. And you're going to tell other people about Jesus. And right now, you're not ready to do that. Because all you have are the basic fundamentals of your salvation. And you know what? That's not enough. We saw that in 1 Peter when he talked about a lion, Satan being like a lion that was roaming the earth looking for someone to devour. And unless you really bulk up in your knowledge of who this Jesus is, you're not going to be able to withstand Satan. And you're certainly not going to be able to talk to other people who are there. So that's what he's talking about. He's saying, you have everything that you need. When you had your salvation, you received the divine power. That's the same power that created the universe. It's an unlimited power that you now have at your disposal. He's given us these things, right? When you receive salvation, you came into instant possession possession of all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, he said, you have it all. It's not like you're a caterpillar that it someday is going to become a butterfly. He said, it's more like you're a newborn baby. You're born again. You have everything that you need. You have all the composite parts and a potential that allows us to be the person that God desires. So you take that infant with all of the natural appendages and everything that he has, and now as that baby grows in knowledge and maturity, so too will you grow in knowledge of your salvation. What does that mean, right? And you're going to become more and more spiritually mature as you do some of these things that I'm going to outline for you. And these things he talks about are life and godliness. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, the life he's talking about is the life of God in the soul of an individual. Well, where's that? That's internal, right? That's the Holy Spirit that now has been embedded in you with your salvation. And the godliness he's talking about is the byproduct of that holiness inside you that then is manifest externally. That's what he's talking about when he says life and godliness. It's the power that you have right now complete to transform on the inside and the outside and the capacity to work out our salvation in accomplishing God's plan for us. And he's going to build on this, and we'll see that as we go through the chapter. And, and if we don't ask God for strength and leading, right, he's already bestowed it upon us. We don't need to ask. We have it. We have it right there. And it's in a measure beyond our wildest dreams. God has supplied believers spiritual gifts. In Romans 12, 1, and Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 12 says, through which he wants to minister to the body of Christ and to the world. And sometimes we stifle those things because of an in inadequate understanding of the power and resources we already possess. What Peter is saying to these people is that, you know what? You've been saved. You've been selected before the foundations of the world were laid. And now you have everlasting life. But what you do on earth now, what are you going to do to glorify me? Because every believer has spiritual gifts that they've been given. But if they're not used, they lie dormant. And what Peter is saying is, I don't want them to be dormant. And I want to show you how you can mature. I want to show you how you can be sure of your faith, right? And that's what is our responsibility of our salvation, not to let go and let God. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker, right? It shouldn't be that. It should say, hold on and let God. Right, Because Peter's saying, because God has given us this divine power and this precious and very great promise of these spiritual gifts, and he's taken us out of the corruption of the world, for that very reason, you do your part. Right, In essence, give everything you have. Make your salvation a priority. Make your spiritual growth a priority. In essence, give everything you have. We have all we need, but now you have to apply yourself to that power. And that's what he's encouraging these believers to do, to understand that the salvation doesn't stop there. And you say, you know what? Boy, that's great, Peter. I just wish you could tell us how to do it. Peter does, right? As we start to get into these verses, he says this. He says, make every effort to supplement your faith. So in other words, 
you believe God, you trust God, okay, and he, Peter emphasized it's not just a saving faith, but it's a living faith, right, and so you live by faith every single day, you remember, you remember your salvation, you remember what it was like when you became a Christian, you trust God every day to do the work he wants you to do, that's your platform, that's your foundation, but then he says, you take that faith as the foundation and add to it virtue, that's the first one he gives us, excellence of life. The best thing that a Christian can do is to fulfill all that a Christian can be, be like Christ. Well, how do you do that? Well, it means you got to do some work. It means you got to understand who was Christ. You got to understand what the definition of all of those words were. What does it mean to be your Messiah? What does it mean to be your Lord and Savior? That takes some work, right? So he's saying that's the first thing you're going to do. But when you have faith, then, then you want to add virtue, which we talked about, but then you want to add to that knowledge. Well, that's practical wisdom. True knowledge acts. It's not stagnant. So Peter's saying, get into the scriptures. Pray. Ask for discernment. Use that divine power that you have in the Holy Spirit to really kind of convict you to say, what is it you want me to learn, Lord? What is it that you need me to eliminate from my life? What is it that you want me to do to my neighbors? What is it you want me to do to other people I come into contact with, right? That's the foundational knowledge that he's saying, if you have that salvation, now these are the things that you're going to do to become more and more mature. Well, after knowledge, he says self-control. As you learn more about what God wants you to do in your life, you're going to start saying to some things, you know, I used to do that, but I'm kind of getting convicted now that maybe that's not something I should do. So I'm going to start pulling away. I'm going to control the passions rather than being controlled by them right? I'm going to break the will of sin. I'm going to have more self-discipline. I'm going to bring all things into the capacity and the captivity of Christ. What does that mean? Well, that means you kind of got to study the scriptures and you got to understand what Jesus is saying. This is what you should do. And this is what you shouldn't do. And then you take it into your own life and you start to kind of look at it and you run it through that filter and say, boy, is this kind of captive to what Christ would want? And no, it's not. So I need to kind of have self-control and get that out of my life. And then he says, after you do that, I want you to do another thing. I want you to add patience. Well, okay, that means to persevere with courage against all odds. These were persecuted people. He's saying, I think you need to have patience. You need to stand against Satan's attacks. Don't give in. Don't give up. Be persistent, right? And fall back onto the things that you're learning about what it means to be a Christian. And always remember what your salvation means. Always remember what Jesus did for you. Always remember what that means. What is my responsibility to give back? And patience is one of those things. The next thing he says is godliness. Well, okay, godliness is basically reverence or worship. It's a life of awe towards God. Do you do that each day? Do you wake up and, and be in awe of God? As you, as you go to him and as you pray and as you ask for direction, as you tap into that divine power? Or do you just kind of go through the motions to say, I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to have devotions today? That's not what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, you're putting your whole self into that. And again, you're building off of this platform of your salvation and your faith, right? These are all byproducts that take place after that, right? And then finally, he says, add brotherly love or kindness. That's a friendship, right? Be affectionate to one another. It's a friendship, but it's with a spiritual perspective. Doesn't steel sharpen steel, right? As you, as you get together with other Christians, you're, you're demonstrating friendship, but it's not just to call and talk about how are the Giants doing, right? Or how are the Yankees doing? It's to talk about your salvation. It's to talk about, you know, what else can we be doing here to, to kind of uh, bring the word of the Lord to, a, to a, a, an agnostic Fairfield County? right? That's the friendship he's talking about. You want to kind of bond together with others to encourage one another in their Christian walk. And then he finishes with love, always with love, right? It's that sacrificial selflessness, a sacrifice for one another. That's what he's saying to do. And if you think about, if you can apply each of those things to your lives, what that would do, how would you change as a person? How would your influence be, be stronger for people that are non-believers? These are all the things that Peter's saying, just remember, it starts with your salvation. And you're a Christian, but that's not good enough. I need you now to become a more mature Christian, and with that, manifest the fruits of the Spirit.
And he keeps saying, don't forget, remember the greatness of that salvation. Remember the sacrifice Christ made for us and his love for us. And Peter wants to make sure they make the investment to apply these things to their lives. He basically is saying, I'm going to nag you until I'm dead, that these are the things I want you to remember. These are the things I want you to implement in your lives. Now, when you do that, there's a reward, right? We see that happens. What God wants to produce in the believer's life, when all these things are manifest in your life, you're not barren. He's saying you're fruitful. Barren is useless or unproductive, but he wants us to be just the opposite. He said, do these things and you'll be fruitful. Well, what does fruitful mean? Well, fruitful means that you're going to produce fruit in your life that other people are going to see. They're going to say, you know what, why does this guy, how can he act like that? He's getting persecuted. He's getting, you know, kind of uh, harangued. He's lost his job, but yet he's got this peace about him. He's got this, this nature that is attractive to me. How does he do it? I've got to ask him what he's doing. That's what Peter's saying. Once you do that, you're going to be fruitful. But that can't happen if you don't follow those things that I just talked to you about. You can't do it on your own power. You have to tap into that divine power. And notice he says, these things don't just happen, but they happen at an increasing rate, right? You have to have more than necessary. That's what it's saying, is that, that the fruit in your life is going to be so overwhelming that people are going to say, look at this guy. You know, what is going on with this life? And they can only attribute that to the divine power that is there. James 2.20 says it this way, faith without works is dead. You've all heard that voice. But when he's talking about dead, he's talking not deaf, but unproductive, useless, barren, producing no good for God. That's what he's talking about there. And he's addressing Christians. And it's the same word he uses to speak of the deadness of an unbeliever is used to speak of the barrenness of a Christian. So if you're not pursuing these things that Peter's talking about, if you're sitting back and say, you know what, I'm saved, that's good enough for me. That's the barrenness that he's talking about. That's not why you were saved. You were saved because God has a plan for your life to bring others to Christ. And if you're not doing these things that Peter's talking about, then you're just as unproductive as an unbeliever would be. An unproductive of Christian is of no more use to God than an unbeliever. That's what he's saying. Conversely, he's saying if you do these things, your heart is going to change. Your internal being is going to change. And now when you do acts, it's going to be a fruitful act. You're going to be motivated by the love of Christ. You're going to be motivated by the knowledge of Christ to do things for people. If you do it the other way, and that's the way, if you think about the letter that started this in the introduction, he was acting, but there was no attitude of love for Christ. He didn't understand his salvation. In fact, it got so overwhelming for him because he was overwhelmed by the sinful things that took place in his life. And so he couldn't be a witness because he, he was in darkness. He didn't even understand what his salvation meant. You know, a good example of that is Chuck Colson. If you remember, Chuck Colson was the White House counsel during the Nixon years. And he was sent to prison because of the Watergate scandal and his lying and covering up because of it. But, you know, when he was in there, he says in his book, you know, that, that he basically, uh, Born Again is the name of the book, he said, you know what, I, I started to understand who Jesus was. Somebody witnessed to him and told me, and I had a lot of time in prison. So I started to read, and I started to understand, and I became more curious, and I wanted to know more about who was this Jesus, and I became a Christian. I, I became, and then I got even more hungry to understand, well, what does that mean to be a Christian? And you know what he did? When, when he looked at that through the eyes of a Christian, he looked around at the prisons and said, there's there's not enough witnessing going on in the prisons. So he started a prison ministry. He didn't do it on his own power. He did it under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that said, first, I'm going to change you, and then you're going to change the prison system in America. And that's exactly what he did. That's what, what Peter is talking about here, is if you become fruitful, right, these are the things. You're going to look around in your environment. You're going to say, I can change this. I can change that. But you're going to do it through the filter of a spiritually mature Christian. Not someone who's saved and sits back and says somebody else can do it. No, you're going to be motivated to do it because of your knowledge and, and the increasing conviction of the Holy Spirit. When there's no fruit, you're not taking up your responsibility. 
And then what happens is you start to forfeit the confidence and the security of your salvation. You even begin to doubt your salvation, Peter says. The confidence and security is a gift of God to the obedient. Said differently, when you're starting to do these things that are outlined in this chapter, you're going to have even more of a confidence of your salvation, more of an excitement about what it means to be a Christian. And that's going to then show and manifest in the works that you do. He says, whoever lacks these things, meaning doesn't do them, is lazy, right? They become nearsighted. They've forgotten that they've been saved. They're filled with doubt. Why? Because they're looking at earthly things, right? They can only see things that are right in front of them. They're caught up in the stuff of this world. And they're looking out towards eternity almost as an impossibility because it's too fuzzy. Why? Because they're not growing and maturing as a Christian. So they kind of get swallowed up by what the world has to offer. And that's where Satan is. Satan wins when that takes place, right? Because he's now taken you off the field of being an effective witness. You've become barren and haven't really done anything to help the, the kingdom. So Peter said, be diligent on these things. Make your calling and election sure. Don't fall from salvation, but their confidence gets stronger as they kind of do these things. They become more sure of their salvation. And your rest, he's calling it rest. You'll be at peace. It'll not only be now, but it'll be forever. Because when you're fruitful, he said your entrance into heaven will be abundant. Think about that, right? I, I read that and I got this picture of an old Western, you know, where the, the guy is in at the bar who's just shot and killed somebody. And here comes the hero. And he walks into the saloon and he pushes open the door and all heads turn and look at him. That's what I visualized when Peter's saying you're coming abundantly into the kingdom, right? You won't slip in. You'll richly enter the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? That's what he's talking about. He's saying, I want you to be fulfilled as a believer. You start with your salvation. You remember what Christ did for you. You apply these things that we're talking about. You get a deeper and deeper knowledge of who Christ is. You start to apply your spiritual gifts that have been given to every believer, and you become massively fruitful, and you attract people to the kingdom. That's what I want to see. That's what you want to do. And you know what, readers? That's what I want you to start with right now. You're believers, but I need you to grow as believers. I need you to be more and more mature. Well, finally, he talks about the rewards of salvation. Peter says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to remind you, parentheses, nag you of these things. I know I'm going to die soon. You know, this letter was written in 63 AD. Peter was killed during the period of Nero. Nero reign ended in 63. So there's no matter of months and then Peter's going to be dead. And he's saying these things refer to all of those things that I've just talked to you about. But then he says in verses 15 to 21, there's some other things I need to make sure you're aware of, and you're going to get them if, if you become more of a mature Christian. You see, what was happening here is false teachers were starting to infiltrate the congregation that he was writing to. And he's saying, if you stay static and just have your salvation, you're not going to be able to discern truth. And these false teachers are going to come in. And what they were doing is they were basically coming in and saying, there is no second coming. You know, that's a, that's a fallacy. Peter is wrong. Right. And so now you're a Christian that really doesn't have the depth of knowledge. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? Well, Peter again says, remember, right, the second coming. Why? They've infiltrated. But Peter says, we didn't follow some philosophy or some humanly devised false story. We're telling you about the second coming because we've seen it with our own eyes. Remember in Matthew 16, Jesus told them, get your spiritual priorities in order. Why? Verse 27 says, because the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Therefore, guys, disciples, make sure you're ready to receive a reward rather than judgment, right? Peter's saying, I heard it firsthand. I didn't you know, make this up. I heard it directly from Jesus, who, by the way, died for your sins on the cross, and that's why you have salvation today. And he said, and if that's not good enough, Matthew 17 talks about Peter and John and James seeing Christ's transfiguration, right? Where he peeled back his human layers and they saw the glory of God in its fullness, where his, his garments turned white and they, they couldn't even see. And then they hear a thundering voice of God saying, this is my son who I'm well pleased with. That's an eyewitness testimony. So when, when you want to talk about 
false teacher saying there's no second coming, I beg to differ. He said, so remember, remember what we taught you, right? Peter says, don't believe these false teachers. I've seen Christ in his glory personally. We have examples in our own lives that help us remember the presence of God that we can't forget. If I deliberately determine to remember, I'm flooded with memories of what God has done. We don't get to talk to Peter, right? We can read what he said. But in each of our lives as a Christian, there are certain things that we can look back and say, I see the presence of God in my life because I know who God is. And I have one of those. And it, right after I moved from Chicago to Connecticut, well, I had lived in Chicago for about 25 years. And for eight of those years, I, I was on a board of a Christian high school. And every year they had a golf outing. And so this was the first year that I hadn't been to it in a while. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get out and do it. It's on a Monday. So I was going to fly out early Monday out of White Plains Airport. I was going to fly to Chicago. I was going to do the golf out and go to the dinner. And then I was going to turn around and come back that night. And the reason I remember it so vividly is because it would have been easier to stay. But the next day, I was taking my two sons to a Yankee game. And all I could think about was getting delayed in Chicago and my two sons sitting there with their baseball hat and lid on ready to go. And I said, no, I've got to get out and back in the same day. Well, I got a phone call uh, about two o'clock on that Monday, right? And we're finishing up the golf. And it was my CFO who was in Chicago. And he said, look, you need to come in, right? We have budgets that are due in two days. We have infighting going on between marketing and sales about how the money is going to be allocated. I said, can't we do this by conference call? No Zoom at that point. And he said, no, we, they really need to get it in. So I begrudgingly called my assistant, changed my flight to the next day, and I you know, then got a hotel room to stay there. And so now you understand the backstory of why I was in my office in Chicago on September 11, 2001, and not in my office in New York to World Trade Center 66 floor. That's a remembrance that I have, that I know that God was in my life. For whatever the reason, he said, I'm going to protect you from being at that location on that particular day. And he did. He protected me for some purpose to say, I'm not done with you here on earth. I need you to continue to, to be my, my disciple here on earth. So when you've seen evidences of God's revelation in your lives, it helps you reestablish, to remember your salvation, to remember there is an omniscient God that is looking out for your benefit, that has a plan for your life that he wants to see implemented. And again, what Peter is telling us, you can only do it if you're going to mature. You can only do it if you follow these outlines that I'm giving you in this, this epistle. Peter said, I'll remember the revelation of God in my life. He walked with him. He was with Jesus. He knew Jesus was God. He knew everything that was there. What is your remembrance? What do you hold on to to help you know that your salvation is true and it is real? If you're focusing on those things, there's no room in your life or in your mind to get cluttered with other things that happen in the world. And praising God is simply reciting the things that he's done for you, which involves his attributes and his works. I praise God every day for keeping me in Chicago that day. If you focus on false doctrines of living, you're going to wash away your memory of all the things that God has done in your life. And that's not what you want to do. And he said, remember the resources of your salvation. Don't forget the scripture. That's how he finishes his first chapter. The Bible is the greatest source for us to validate what's going to happen in our lives. See the readers for Peter, the second coming, it's all there. We can read about it and we know with certainty when someone is telling us it's a myth, when someone's telling us that can't possibly be true, we go to the Bible for the truth. And we go there because there's knowledge and we base our foundation of our salvation on the knowledge that's in that scripture. So until the day when Christ returns, you got to look to the word of God as a man in pitch blackness looks to a light. What a great illustration, right? It's our, our saving grace. It's our knowledge. It's our truth that we have to base our life on that. And so the conclusion Peter says here is remember the word of God. It's the surest word. Run to it as you would a light in the midst of darkness and have 
confidence in it because you know that it didn't come from any private origination. It wasn't the invention of any man, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Why run to the word? Because it's authored by God's spirit. And that's what Peter wants us to remember as well. We have the scripture to really guide our life and finish it. Well, as we conclude tonight, let's go back to the opening story about the man who sent a letter to his pastor questioning his salvation. Maybe some of you have been in that same position. Ask yourself this question. How many times have you asked Christ into your life? Right? You did it way back, but now there's been this period of barrenness. So you say, well, you know what? Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe I better do it again. Right? If you're there or if you've done that, right? You've lost maybe a passion for your salvation. Maybe you're even questioning if you really are saved, like this guy did in the in the of the opening. So how do you avoid that feeling of uncertainty? Well, many of you know that I spent three weeks in Israel this past summer, a fantastic trip. But one of the most impactful trips was one we took to a sheep factory. You heard it right, a sheep factory. It was an incredible scale of an enterprise. I mean, it was a huge warehouse. And on one side, you would have trucks that would unload these sheep that were filthy, by the way, and they would bring them in and they would actually shear them right there. And they had people that were taking this wool and they were dumping it onto a conveyor belt, which then was kind of run through. First, it was rinsed. Then there was some detergent that was put on top of it. And then what would happen is it would be rinsed again. And then it went into another portion of the conveyor belt and they had these claws that kind of pulled it apart. And then it went back in and got more detergent and rinsed and then was kind of flipped upside down, more water, more rinsing. And that water was black by the time it got out. And if you remember, we talked about sheep last week. And we talked about how they secrete this lanolin, this oil that basically acts almost like a fly trap, right? So the dust and the dirt and, the, and everything just kind of sticks to it. So it gets sheared and it has to be cleaned before it can be used. So as it goes through this conveyor, it's then dried. And then at the other end of the, the factory, they're, they're binding it together in these big bales and then they put it onto a truck. And, and it, was, it was kind of interesting to watch that whole thing. But what Peter is telling us tonight is we can't live out our salvation alone. We need to tap into the divine power. When Peter says you've got everything you need, he means it. We have the Holy Spirit right? We tap into the power of God to maintain the enthusiasm of our salvation. That's what he's telling us. But picture yourself on that conveyor belt in the sheep factory, being cleansed and rinsed of your sins by the power of God to forgive us our sins. Imagine if you did that every day, multiple times a day, drawing on God's power to forgive your fresh sins, to clean the dirt of the world off of your earthly body. How? Well, reading the word, prayer, reflection, repentance. You see, that prepares you every day to go out and accomplish the purposes of God in your life. Our friend in the opening had become so overcome with his sins and self-help solutions that he lost his way. He became barren. Satan wins by re rendering a Christian ineffective, fruitless, and barren in God's purpose for his life. That's what happened to the guy who wrote the letter. He was saved. He was just so clouded with clutter and the communication between him and God were done. Why? Because he tried to do it on his own power. He didn't look and tap into that divine power because if he did, the conduit would have been clear instead of him being overwhelmed to the point that he doubted his own salvation. And we can get there the same way if we don't apply the things that Peter's talking about here. So Peter says you have the basics, you have the knowledge, you have access to the power to regenerate you each day. Do you have the will? That's what he's asking these Christians. Peter says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep reminding you. And the beauty for us, if we forget or if we temporarily lose our passion, we have Peter's letters to help us remember. We have the scriptures. And if your life is not virtuous and godly, it's not the absence of spiritual resources. It's the absence of your will to apply them to your lives. Peter basically could have said it this way, that 
it was said by Paul in Colossians 2, 9, and 10. All of God is in Christ, and all of Christ is in you. Remember that power and use it to achieve God's purpose for your salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're stunned by the, the wisdom Peter has. We see it, we read it, Lord, and we know in our lives we're guilty of some of the same things that he's writing to these Christians about. And Lord, we pray tonight that people have been convicted in their own lives. Perhaps they've fallen back a little bit. Perhaps they're not pursuing you with the priority that you would like them to do. Perhaps they're not using their spiritual gifts. They've become barren. And Lord, we pray that you will convict them to go back and reread this chapter and to understand what is it they need to do to kind of shed this thinking, to shed the loss of their, their excitement and passion for their salvation and their desire to become more spiritually mature, to be used by you as a tool to bring others to Christ. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Amen, Jack. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jack. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you, Jack. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jack. Got it in right under the line. Thank you. Good night.